the most obvious divergence would be the identification of Jesus as the Messiah, which Christians affirm at the heart of their faith and which Jews reject. It becomes a family feud, which of course can be very uh, hot as family feuds tend to be. Uh, our understanding of the one God uh, does not leave room for a formal Trinitarian structure. Christianity, especially the Catholics, they made a combination between paganism and the Jewish faith. The Jews were the only monotheistic faith in the world, and they adopted it with changes. Later on, another change, another change. Now you cannot even compare it to the Jewish faith. We are the first and the only monotheistic faith in the world. And we will remain so till the real Messiah will come. Il y a des points de recherche pour l'enseignement chrétien afin qu'il redevienne un enseignement qui tienne compte du face à face avec le juif. C'est la question messianique. La concurrence, le contentieux entre juifs et chrétiens porte depuis son origine sur cette question du Messie. Or, si nous nous rappelons que la question messianique est une question juive par essence et par excellence, et qu'elle a pu être appliquée à Jésus dans un contexte juif, Alors, nous nous rendons compte et nous le découvrons de mieux en mieux entre juifs et chrétiens aujourd'hui que la question messianique, au lieu d'être l'objet d'un conflit sans expiation possible, apparaît au contraire comme le point sur lequel nous pouvons nous rencontrer. Juifs qui attendent une venue messianique et chrétiens qui attendent aussi un retour des temps où la vraie signification de Jésus dans l'histoire pourra être évalué dans un sens, dans une terminologie messianique. Ainsi, ce qui était conflictuel jadis peut devenir aujourd'hui lieu d'un débat authentique et même d'un dialogue. Yeshua Mashiach is the Hebrew name of Jesus. It is his real name. Jesus is kind of a Hellenized Greek name that has absolutely no meaning. Christ is a Greek rendition of anointed, which in Hebrew is Messiah, Mashiach. So we call him by his name, Yeshua HaMashiach. And uh, the organization, the members of the organization are all Israeli or Jewish and all believe that Yeshua is the Mashiach and they're spread out around the whole country. Uh, the essence of Messianic Jewish is that we want to be as much as possible like the early church in every aspect that is practical and theologically sound. Traditionally, when Jewish people believed in Jesus, they were swallowed in and assimilated into the Western Christian denominations and therefore lost their identity completely as Jews, yes. And it would, it would, it just wouldn't do for God to be returning us back to our land after 2,000 years of exile. And that because we believe in our own Messiah, in the King of the Jews, we stop being Jewish. Since Yeshua himself was a Jew, his message was Jewish, there is no contradiction being a believer in Yeshua and remaining a Jew. Just on the contrary, we are complete Jews by our faith in the Messiah. We wish to follow the instructions of the Old and New Testaments as one unit of the Word of God, one fulfilling the other. Yeshua was and is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. and. Uh, through him, only through him, through the New Testament, I could find the specific answers to the questions I was asking myself. 25 years ago, I became a, 
believer, a follower, a disciple of, of Yeshua HaMashiach, many, many people said, what do you believe in a myth? It doesn't, he never was. Never existed such a person. The Christians invented him in order to persecute us. Most Jews are totally confused when they meet a Messianic Jew. When they meet me, they don't know how to, to, to relate to me because they see that I am Jewish. I observe the Jewish holidays, the Jewish traditions, I eat kosher. And they see that I also believe in Yeshua. And so that confuses them completely. They don't know how to live with it. Well, I, I, I just don't understand that. Um, what does it mean that they remain Jewish? If they have accept Jesus as Christ, the Messiah, they are Christians. They're not Jewish. We are still expecting the coming of the Messiah. Because according to our tradition, the coming of the Messiah will bring the kingdom of God and the whole change in the world. There will be total peace and total justice. And uh, um, though I feel that, that uh, Jesus is in the design of God, I haven't seen much uh, total peace or order in the last 2,000 uh, years, especially coming from Christians, among Christians and Christians vis-à-vis uh, -vis Jews. We don't consider Jesus uh, as a holy man. We, we were fighting against his ideas. We are against reformism in the Jewish faith. And he tried, he fought to, to, to introduce a reform way in the Jewish faith. For us, he was not a messiah altogether. At the beginning of the restoration of the State of Israel in 48, we finished our second historic era of dispersion and we started the Messianic era. And whatever we, are, we will do, will be successful. Why? We are promised by the prophets that in the moment that we will enter the third period of our life, the Messianic era, there's no way back. We will have to go from strength to strength. And we are going from strength to strength. I believe it. Makes a difference what we are going to decide. It is a heavenly process on us. Écoutez, on parle beaucoup aujourd'hui de l'ère messianique parce que nous avons dans notre tradition biblique les prophètes et talmudiques, les sages, qui ont les uns et les autres des millénaires, les textes sont millénaires, un très grand nombre d'échéances précises qui sont données et qui notamment indiquent que lorsque les juifs reviendront sur la terre d'Israël, lorsque dans le monde il y aura un certain nombre d'oppositions flagrantes, notamment par des conflits mondiaux, internationaux, nous nous trouverons repositionnés pour le fameux messianisme. Everything that is going to be done in the messianic era according to Maimonides should be done by Messiah as a person. He will build the temple, he will gather the Jews from all over the world, he will conquer, he will liberate Israel, he will restore the Jewish kingdom in Israel. But according to the Jerusalem Talmud, we are not relying on the personification of Messiah. Messiah will come as a person too. But this will be the last days of the era. The process of redemption has begun at one of the later stages. Of the, at the completion of this process, there will be the Messiah who will be a coming of the family of David and the Jewish kingdom will be reestablished uh, and uh, the Jews will reach a certain stage of completion in their faith and in their Jewish conduct according to the Jewish laws, then the Jewish people will be a blessing to all the nations of the world. On ne dit nulle part que tout le monde deviendra juif. On dit que les hommes resteront ce qu'ils sont. 
mais que simplement chacun reconnaîtra qu'elle a été la vocation spirituelle et historique du peuple juif. On reconnaîtra la primauté d'Israël au plan de son origine euh, biblique. On dira « le peuple juif a donné un message universel » qui a servi à créer toutes sortes de courants. Je vous rappelle qu'il y a 635 religions et sectes qui ont comme origine le judaïsme, et que le, cet aveu de reconnaissance, si vous voulez, constituera véritablement le messianisme juif. Jérusalem deviendra la capitale, non pas internationale, politique du monde, mais la capitale spirituelle. As a colleague, the mayor of Jerusalem once expressed it, he said, you are waiting for the return of the Messiah. And we are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And when he comes, we all know who he is, and all arguments will be settled. And uh, it is in this uh, prophetic expectation that we can find common ground. The Christian embassy wants to represent, in a very practical and concrete way, this love of the Christians worldwide to the Jewish people and to the reborn state of Israel. The Feast of Tabernacles, biblically speaking, is called uh, the Messiah's Feast because Christians expect the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to return at the Feast of Tabernacles. Jewish people expect the Messiah to come at the Feast of Tabernacles. So when we as Christians celebrate this feast here in Jerusalem, the Jewish people don't feel threatened because we celebrate the same prophetic event that still has to happen. We only disagree of the identity of the one who is to return. And so for us as Christian Zionists, We don't see it as a prerequisite to relate to the Jewish people that they have to accept Jesus as the Messiah because we know, you know, if they expect the Messiah to come, at, at some point they will see who he is and uh, then we will all agree. If Jesus himself didn't know when he's going to come back, I doubt that some Pentecostal preacher or somebody else knows when he's going to come back. I've heard prophecies in this city by Christians that he's coming back in three day days, in six months, next year. Of course, all of them was, were false prophecies. And I'm not interested in them. I'm interested to be ready now. These are Jewish people uh, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We have very close relations with them. Uh, they've come to see the Christian embassy as a friend. And uh, often we are criticized by other Jewish people for our contacts with them, but, you know, um, our answer to them is you cannot expect us to reject the Jewish people who believe in the Messiah the way we do. I will tell you the truth. I hate the missionaries. Missionarism is against Judaism. Because Christianity sees itself as a daughter religion, being born within Judaism, claiming the central interpretation of Judaism, which is, which you can see that in the terms, Old Testament, New Testament. For Jews, there's no Old Testament, there's only Torah, which is always new. It's as if we received it today. But for Christians, what is precious to Jews is called the old. And what's fresh and vital is called by them the new. Because of that, some feel that, by definition, Christianity must be anti-Semitic or anti-Judaic. Sometime in 1947, a Bedouin shepherd boy who was looking for a missing goat, went into a cave and found jars. He was greatly disappointed that the jars did not contain gold, but he found there some old pieces of leather. There were remains of a library of a Jewish sect that made this place on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, Qumran, their headquarters. They kept there a monastery. And in that monastery that existed for about two centuries, 
they had a room in which books were copied, a scriptorium. We believe that they are their seeds. They were very influential on Christianity, not on Judaism. And they attracted a lot of interest from their contemporary, because they resembled nobody. They're living without women, without children, without money, all things that were considered by normal people to be the most important things in life. And the most important point in their theology or there was their belief in predestination, very alien to normative Judaism. There must have been some contact between them and John the Baptist, undoubtedly. And as for Jesus, we know that he knew them very well. Both their sins and Jesus believed that poverty is good for you. Poverty is conducive to perfection. And both had very poor view of the rich. In the teachings of Ted Pond, you can see in the epistles, one can find so many verses that read like quotations from the Dead Sea Sabbath. Even the language, the spirituality, the dichotomy between flesh and spirit. It has so a series of lessons. Jesus uh, was Jewish, but Paul tried to sell uh, Jesus' ideas to the Romans. So he really um, betrayed Jewish tradition in order to, to accomplish his goal. So then he brought ideas that don't belong to Judaism from, from uh, Greek philosophy and, and Roman uh, ideology into Judaism, and he sold the, pro the product to the rest of humanity. Now, um, Paul is very complicated. He's not only accepting Jesus as, as the Messiah, but he also has all his Jewish background that is battling inside him. So he talks about, well, perhaps by accepting Jesus, you don't need to follow halakha, that is the, all the, the laws relating to everyday life. And at the same time, uh, you realize that he say, well, perhaps you can follow halakha and, and accept Jesus. And then the problem that, that he has to face is the question, well, what, what are we going to do with the Greeks and the Romans and, and who, have, who have a pagan uh, a tradition? How are they going to reach Jesus? And, and at the same time, he, he, he realizes, well, but God established a covenant with the Jewish people. Will God betray his own covenant? I mean, God doesn't do some, something like that. When God promises something, God is continues with, with his promise. You have to start brushing a little bit better. From what I understand, Paul actually said, we don't need the ritual so much. And just the acceptance of Jesus, the acceptance of God, is enough to make me a good person and make me a good religious Christian. I don't know if he was called a Christian at the time. Um, and we have to accept, you know, what he would say is we would have to accept him as our Lord, and then we're good people, we're good Christians. Um, Judaism does not believe that. Without ritual, without something to bind you on a daily basis to the religion, religion is very easily, very easily forgotten. For the average Christian, there is very little ritual that one does at home. Um, for a Jew, you're surrounded by ritual from the minute you wake up. You get up in the morning, you wash your hands, you make a blessing. Um, the first day of your life, first thing your mother does or the or the doctor does or the person does is they look outside the window where they look at the clock to see what hour you were born to see exactly when your circumcision is going to be. And the reason we do a circumcision is because God said to us on the eighth day you shall circumcise your son. Il significato religioso della Milà è, nasce molto lontano nella, nella storia del popolo ebraico ed è praticamente il primo patto nella storia appunto di tutti i popoli di tutte le generazioni che fa Kadosh Baruch Hu, cioè il Signore con un popolo ben preciso. Da questo patto richiede eh, appunto la circoncisione, cioè l'incisione nella carne come segno ben preciso per appunto l'osservanza poi futura di tutte quelle leggi che verranno date al popolo ebraico nella sua storia, partendo appunto con Abramo 
fino ad arrivare appunto con Mosè, Mosè, Mosè il legislatore, e con appunto i dieci comandamenti e quindi il proseguimento della storia, tutta la storia del popolo ebraico. Comunque eh, questo patto viene dato appunto nella Genesi, cioè con la nascita appunto del, dell'umanità, vediamo, differisce appunto dal, dalle sette leggi date a Noè che erano considerate per tutta l'umanità intera, mentre appunto da questo momento avviene il distacco cioè di un popolo che appunto servirà per trasmettere appunto le leggi del Signore per tutta l'umanità e per far conoscere appunto il verbo di Dio a tutto il mondo. The circumcision, removing the foreskin, is um, sort of symbolic of removing the covering that covers your heart. In medieval terminology, in Jewish, Jewish discussion, the heart represents the soul, what people think. And one can't truly come to love God until you take away the mask, take away that which covers your heart. And a parallel is, is drawn that you know, a Jewish boy really is only whole, really can only serve God, really can, um, you know, can, can be a, a full Jew until that act is done. One example of a mitzvah, of a commandment that was accepted with joy and has been kept throughout the centuries, even um, when we've been told that if you do circumcise your children, you will be killed, and there were periods of Jewish law when that, was, when that happened, um, particularly Roman times, that if a Jew was circumcised, he was killed. If you circumcise your child, you were killed. The theology of Jews, at two points, one and one and one and one and one and one and one un inconvénient dans l'intérêt même des juifs c'est de créer et d'être un des ferments de l'antisémitisme parce que euh, partout où, où le judaïsme a été en contact avec les différents peuples, même avant le christianisme euh, les gens avaient tendance à se dire mais enfin qu'est-ce que c'est que ce peuple qui prétend avoir le seul vrai Dieu, qui est la seule vraie nation élue le seul ceci, le seul cela et nous autres, bon, ben, euh, à la rigueur, on peut être bien si on est des bons, des bons, des justes des nations, mais euh, malgré tout, c'est eux qui sont appelés à guider le monde vers le salut. Je pense que les juifs euh, de tous les temps, d'ailleurs, y compris du nôtre, n'ont jamais été assez conscients de ce qu'il y avait d'intrinsèquement dangereux dans cette conception, à laquelle pourtant ils ne peuvent pas renoncer. Antisemitism existed in the Roman world long before Christianity. But what happened is that Christianity reinterpreted the pagan antisemitism in Christian terms and even poured gasoline on top of it as the Jews being the Christ killers. The Jew would say that the notion of incarnation is actually a pagan borrowing from the pagan world into Christianity and as such represents a development of Christianity away from its Jewish roots. In our view, God is able to enter into an immediate relationship with humanity without having to assume human form. Hence, virgin birth, uh, the doctrine of the Eucharist, and so on, are all consequences of that fundamental disagreement over whether God needs bodily to have a relationship with embodied creations. Look, all of Judaism, all of the seed of Abraham is a miracle. Sarah was a barren woman, bore a child at the age of 90. That's a miracle, right? The Bible portrays this miracle, every Jew accepts that. Every single hero of Judaism had a miraculous intervention of God in his birth. If I believe in that, it's no problem for me to believe that God could ovulate the womb of Mary. This before us, it is just a joke. I wonder that so many hundreds of millions of people, intelligent people, intellectuals, believe in it. If the Lord wants to create a man, he created Adam. 
He knows how to create it from, from the earth, from, from just from the ground. But not to get, to, 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 to be a, to become a groom of a, of, a, of a girl. When you talk about taking communion and uh, the traditional uh, Catholic viewpoint of transubstantiation, the language of the New Testament, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, would be understood by every Jew in the first century immediately. So long before Jesus was crucified, before he died on the cross, he spoke about, I am the bread from heaven in John chapter 6. Yeah? In a context that is not directly related with communion at all. And uh, Jewish people, Middle Eastern, Semitic mind, can relate to symbolic language much better than Western mind. At a certain point, uh, we can no longer regard Christian theology as a form of Jewish theology. Many Jews believed in the notion of vicarious atonement. Uh, a, a sacrifice is made which atones someone else of sin. It could even be a human righteous person, a, not just an animal, but a human being, a righteous person, a martyr, who through his death atones or expiates for the sins of the community. Many Jews believe that, but Christianity did something new with all with this, with these ideas, and put them together in a totally novel way. But all religion in essence, from the time of Cain and Abel, requires sacrifice. Judaism requires sacrifice. On the Day of Atonement, Jews in Jerusalem and all over the world will go buy a chicken will have it slaughtered and will swing it over their head. Uh, the word that is used is for kaparot, which means for atonement. The blood atones for your sin. So we would like our sins this time of year, being it's this time of the high holy days, to be transferred to the chicken uh, instead of on, on us, as if to say that the chicken should accept all of our sins and transgressions. Judaism always preaches that one has to sanctify yourself from the minute you're born to the minute you die, from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. Before an animal is slaughtered, a blessing is made. We're not blessing the animal, we are blessing God. We're saying, God, thank you for giving us the ability and letting us slaughter a living creature that exists on your earth and giving it to us so that we're able to eat it. And that really um, makes, a, makes a mark on the person that's making that blessing. It's very difficult to become coarse to lose sight of that the fact that you're taking a life because what you're really doing is something that's very serious. God prevented Abraham from actually carrying out the sacrifice of Isaac and provided a ram to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. So sacrifices took the place by nature, took the place of the man who sinned. He shed the blood of the sacrifice instead of his own blood. And so it was, it was perfectly okay because God doesn't delight in human sacrifice. But as far as Abraham himself was concerned, he sacrificed his son. And the Jewish teaching is that actually Abraham sacrificed him. In his own mind, he sacrificed his son. The minute he picked up the knife, he sacrificed his son. In actuality, he didn't because the angel prevented him. Uh, God, on the other hand, there was no one to prevent him. And, uh, and he gave his son in our place, as Isaiah prophesied in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. He gave his son for our atonement, and there was no one to prevent God from doing that. The rabbis in a, in a midrash called Yalkut Shim Oni, uh, when they talk about Isaac and Abraham going up the mountain, the text says in Genesis 22, and Abraham put the wood on Isaac's back, the wood for the sacrifice. And the rabbis say, it says, and Abraham took the wood for the sacrifice and put it on Isaac's back. This is what he did. He put the cross on his shoulder. In other words, the rabbis understood that there is a relationship between what was happening on Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac and the crucifixion.
the elevation of the near sacrifice of Isaac to a central role in Jewish theology it really is uh, a product of um, later times. In fact, some scholars even suggested it is, in fact, a reaction to Christianity. Christians have a very powerful symbol, uh, death of Christ, by which our sins are atoned. Uh, what do Jews have in response? Uh, Christ is not only the perfect offering, as is the Gospel of John, the perfect offering. He's also the perfect high priest uh, and the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement for the community, which puts an end forever for any more need of more sacrifices. For Jews, we still have the sacrificial system on the books in the book of Leviticus. Uh, martyrs are sacrifices too. Uh, and the notion of martyrdom is inextricably connected with the notion of resurrection of the dead and the notion of immortality. Because without that, the martyr dies in vain. Christianity took one particular martyr and elevated him far and beyond and above uh, the status of other martyrs. Uh, and Judaism knows never so. It's a string of martyrs from ancient times through, alas, modern times. Messianic Judaism, separated from traditional Judaism, really only at the second revolt, at the Bar Kokhba revolt. Until that, we have good reasons to believe, with evidence in Jewish literature, that the Jewish Christian community coexisted with the Pharisaic community in the land of Israel with problems, as much problems as the Methodists have with the Baptists, for example. But they coexisted. But during the revolt, a very famous Jewish rabbi by the name of Rabbi Akiva proclaimed one by the name of Bar Koziba, Messiah, and changed his name to Bar Kokhba to fit in with the prophecy from the Book of Numbers, most of Israel joined a revolt against Rome, a hopeless revolt that caused thousands of deaths. Thousands of Jews died. Jerusalem was erased from the earth, plowed under by Hadrian, exiled the Jews from all of Judea into the Galilee and into Rome and to the rest of the world because of this nationalistic revolt. The Jewish Christians knew the real Messiah. They knew who the real Messiah was. They couldn't cooperate and agree to follow a false Messiah. But today every Jew knows that Bar Kokhba was a false Messiah. And therefore that non-participation of the Jewish believers in Jesus in the revolt is what made rabbinical Judaism so bitterly against the Jewish believers. Only after the revolt this became a bitter conflict that hasn't been resolved today. Dès le début, il faut le comprendre, l'église de Jérusalem, quand elle a voulu se constituer, a subi les persécutions des juifs de l'époque. Et au cours de l'histoire, les chrétiens ont, ont rendu les juifs responsables de la mort de Dieu, de la mort de, de Jésus-Christ, ce qui est absolument faux, théologiquement, même si... Dans les faits, c'est comme ça que ça s'est passé. <coughs> Il y a donc toute une histoire, tout un passé euh, antisémite de la part des, 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 de l'Église, et plus particulièrement de l'Église catholique, qui est quelque chose de, de dramatique et que, hélas, nous, nous avons du mal à, disons, à, à, à rejeter. The source of Christian resentment against Jews really started at about 156 AD. There was a doctrine that was brought to Rome by one named Marcion that tried to separate between God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and tried to openly paganize or Hellenize Christianity. The church in Rome managed to overthrow Marcion, not to accept his doctrine but it left a strong residue, anti-Old Testament, anti-Jewish residue, deep, deep, deep in Christian theology. A French uh, historian named Jules Isaac tried to plumb the derivation of this senseless hatred of Jews. And uh, he found it in a tradition of Christian teaching and preaching. And he calls it uh, the teachings of contempt. 
And he said it had three or four basic uh, elements. One was the proposition that uh, Judaism was already spiritually exhausted uh, by the time Jesus came along. Uh, you know, an empty legalistic religion. The second one was that the Jews sort of willfully and knowingly and blinded by uh, carnality, by greed, by whatever, rejected their own Messiah. The third is, of course, uh, uh, the, the deicide myth that Jews were, that the Jews as a people uh, killed Christ and that they are endlessly guilty for that, uh, for that terrible sin. And then the awful, awful correlation of that teaching, which was uh, the suffering of the Jews as providential punishment. You know, people who, whatever they did to the Jews would say, it's not us doing it, that's, that's, that's God's will, because they cut off. One of the enduring sources people have felt is, uh, is in Matthew, you know, the cry, his blood be on us and on our people, which has been interpreted, as many people say, as a warrant for genocide, you know, an endless self-claim of guilt on the part of the Jewish people. Hélas, il faut le dire, l'attitude chrétienne a été marqué par un grand oubli de son origine. Or, avec le cours de l'histoire, l'Église chrétienne, à cause du succès qu'elle a pu connaître, a oublié complètement cette origine, ou en tout cas n'en a gardé qu'un souvenir assez historique ou théorique. Je voudrais rappeler rapidement les trois grands moments de cette histoire sur lesquels il nous faut revenir aujourd'hui pour critiquer très sérieusement ce que fut l'attitude de l'Église chrétienne. Le premier moment, ce fut celui, je dirais, qui a été lié au nom des empereurs Constantin et Justinien, quand s'est constitué un empire chrétien. À ce moment-là, l'Empire chrétien décide du droit et il cherche à établir une faveur pour l'Église chrétienne et le peuple juif n'a pas droit à la parole. C'est ainsi qu'est né en particulier toute la législation de Justinien au détriment du peuple juif. Une deuxième vague d'incompréhension se produit au moment de l'histoire des croisades. Au moment des croisades, quand l'Empire perse est sur le reflux, la papauté imagine de reconquérir les lieux saints, les lieux du tombeau du Christ, pensant même par là activer l'eschatologie et la fin de l'histoire. Les juifs, évidemment, si nous en croyons l'épître aux Romains, par exemple, Romains 9 à 11, doivent jouer un rôle dans cette eschatologie chrétienne. Mais cela est complètement oublié. Et les troupes des croisés, pourtant inspirées par un Saint Bernard qui, qui s'emploiera à empêcher une dérive à l'encontre du peuple juif de la part des princes croisés, néanmoins les croisés, euh, lorsqu'ils traversent les régions de Rhénanie et d'Allemagne, procèdent à une hécatombe du peuple juif. Comment cela a été possible Aujourd'hui encore, nous interrogeons et cela nous étonne. Toujours est-il que des prédicateurs se sont employés à l'époque à activer le zèle des croisés. Et c'est depuis cette date que bien souvent, l'église chrétienne est considérée par le peuple juif comme son ennemi particulier. La troisième période qu'il faut critiquer et regretter dans notre histoire, c'est celle qui est si célèbre et qui est marquée par l'inquisition d'Espagne. Il ne faut pas oublier qu'il y a eu, à, à la fin du XVe siècle, le départ de l'Inquisition qui a été une chose affreuse et que l'on tuait tous les impies et les Juifs étaient des impies de par le fait qu'ils croyaient à un autre Dieu que le Messie ou le Fils de Dieu. Alors, c'est dès l'instant qu'on ne reconnaissait pas son Fils, nous étions des impies et ceux qui, pour une raison ou une autre, parjuraient ou ne voulaient pas se convertir ou n'acceptaient pas la conversion étaient voués au bûcher. Jewish people when they hear that I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, they identified me with Savanarola, with Torquemada, with all the, the with all the Christians who have hated Jews, who have persecuted Jews, who in the name of Jesus have put Jews to death. Even if I wasn't Jewish, I wouldn't identify with the history of Christianity. There is nothing beautiful about it. There is few islands of uh, grace in the 2,000 years of Christian history, few. 
but very few. La manifestazione più chiara di emarginazione fu l'istituzione dei ghetti. Nel 1555 si, si, si chiusero gli ebrei in questi ghetti, il primo fu a Venezia, poi a poco a poco sotto l'influenza della Chiesa quasi tutte le città-stato in cui era divisa l'Italia eh, ebbero i loro ghetti. Siccome erano un, un, davano un cattivo esempio di infedeltà e di perfidia, eh, e di perfidia, cioè di, 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 di mancanza di, 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 di riconoscimento della vera religione, andavano puniti e tenuti chiusi perché non avessero una cattiva influenza sui cristiani. E quindi erano mestieri mest limitati nei mestieri, limitati nello spazio. E certo erano periodi di grande miseria. C'è una chiesa nel ghetto dove venivano tenute le famose prediche coatte, cioè le prediche dove gli ebrei dovevano andare, un certo numero di ebrei ogni, ogni settimana doveva andare lì per ascoltare le prediche in cui cer si cercava di, 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 di persuaderli a convertirsi al cattolicesimo. E allora si racconta che cosa facevano gli ebrei? Andavano, quelli che dovevano andare andavano, ma si mettevano la cera negli orecchi. Per esempio durante il carnevale c'era la corsa degli asini e c'era la corsa degli ebrei. E poi c'era un altro gioco, era quello di mettere un ebreo in una botte e di farlo scendere dal monte del testaccio. E poi ogni anno eh, dovevano, anche questa era una cerimonia simbolica, gli ebrei dovevano andare quando passava l'amministratore della città, allora eh, ogni anno quando arrivava nelle prossimità del ghetto eh, dovevano venire i rappresentanti della comunità a rendergli omaggio. E il governatore della città faceva un, compiva un gesto simbolico, eh, faceva voltare il, la persona più importante della comunità, mh, fingeva di dargli un calcio nel sedere e diceva eh, per quest'anno ancora potete stare ma ricordatevi che siete, siete degli infedeli eccetera. Roma fu l'ultimo ghetto italiano a chiudersi e fu chiuso, le porte del ghetto furono abbattute quando arrivarono le truppe piemontesi nel 1870. Quindi è poco più di un secolo che gli ebrei non sono più nel ghetto a Roma. No, non posso dire che la Chiesa abbia emancipato gli ebrei. L'emancipazione degli ebrei è figlia del risorgimento della nascita di una nazione italiana unita, dalle idee che sono nate dall'illuminismo in poi, e della fine del dominio papale sugli stati pontifici. L'Eglise du temps où elle avait le pouvoir, car elle l'a tout de même eu en gros pendant 15 siècles, l'Eglise a eu l'astuce, la sagesse de toujours donner un statut aux Juifs, un statut ambigu d'ailleurs, dont les Juifs ne peuvent pas se satisfaire, j'en suis bien conscient. Un statut qui à la fois les exaltait et les déprimait. Mais l'Église avait le sentiment d'avoir besoin du judaïsme, parce que euh, confusément et même clairement, l'Église a toujours pensé que Israël était le peuple euh, aîné de la promesse. C'est eux qui nous ont servi sur un plateau les prophéties dont l'Église vit. Alors, il y a des discussions sur le Messie, le Messie souffrant pour les uns, le Messie triomphant pour les autres, mais ce sont les mêmes notions. Donc l'Église a besoin des Juifs. Et c'est la raison fondamentale pour laquelle il est impensable que l'Église, euh, euh, comment dire, euh, imagine une, une suppression euh, des Juifs. Hitler was not the first one to force Jews to wear yellow stars, not the first one to place Jews in ghettos, not the first one to tell Jewish doctors that they could not treat non-Jews, not the first one to burn the Talmud. All this and more was first done by the Vatican, by the church, without 1,500 years of Vatican anti-Semitic activity, Hitler would have had no one to learn from. And during the war, It's about time for the Vatican to face up to the reality that it was minimally guilty of sins of omission. The Vatican was in a position to save hundreds of thousands of Jews. And after the war, they were more interested in helping fleeing Nazis than they were in protecting the remnants of European Jewry. Fino dal 1941-42 
sapevano che dei, ci sono delle lettere precise, c'è per esempio la documentazione di un frate eh, che accompagnava i treni ospedali, delle descrizioni eh, da in, che arrivavano dai nunci apostolici sullo sterminio degli ebrei. Sì, la Chiesa sapeva. Queste deportazioni avvennero praticamente sotto le finestre del Papa, non era molto lontano il Vaticano dal luogo dove sono avvenute queste deportazioni. La Chiesa protestò solo per, eh, perché le leggi razziali, così come erano concepite dal fascismo su ispirazione del nazismo, non riconoscevano la validità del battesimo, cioè un ebreo rimaneva ebreo anche se era battezzato. Allora la Chiesa protestò contro eh, le persecuzioni degli ebrei battezzati e contro l'annullamento dei matrimoni misti. Pio XII aveva eh, una specie di terrore del comunismo, eh, del, dell'impero sovietico e pensava che il nazismo, che la Germania potesse essere una diga che proteggesse l'Europa cristiana dal, dal comunismo. Puis sous l'occupation, les catholiques étaient pétinistes à 99,5% et ils étaient même par là même d'accord avec la politique de Pétain qui obligeait les juifs à porter l'étoile jaune et ce avant même que les allemands ne le lui demandent. Et pendant cette époque-là, les catholiques n'ont rien fait. We have a term in Judaism which is called Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of the name. Uh, Kiddush Hashem uh, roughly means in Judaism anyone who dies for the fact that he is Jewish. Kiddush Hashem meant that a person, a Jewish person, is offered the choice of either adopting another religion or die. However, since every Jew who died in the Holocaust died because he was Jewish, although he was never given the choice, uh, we viewed them as being martyrs in a, in a broad sense. Yes, the Jews see that about themselves as part of our Jewish self-conception, right? That these are sacrifices demanded of us by God, the martyrs and those who have been killed. They are sacrifices. We have to offer up one of our own to the Lord, because the Lord requires it. I don't think the Christians are imposing a sacrifice on the Jews. Uh, the evils inflicted over the uh, centuries upon the Jewish communities of Europe, I'm not sure it was seen in terms of atonement. Uh, I think it was seen also in terms of punishment, or it was seen in many ways as uh, reenacting the myth of Christian beginnings, that the desecration of the host and the blood libel. As I say, Jews are once again crucifying Jesus. Now, the Jews of our own time, not just the Jews of 800 years or 1,000 years earlier, our own Jews living right here in our town are redoing it again. And whereas the Lord punished them last time, now, now we will punish them. Because atonement, after all, implies the sin is removed, right? The victim has to be blemish-free, as the book of Leviticus says quite explicitly. Christ was blemish-free. The Jews are not blemish-free. It's a different, uh, it's a different system. It's a different set of values. They're not sacrificing the Jews. They're killing the Jews. God wanted that the Holocaust should be, and we don't know why. We never will be able to comprehend what God's reasons were. As Orthodox Jews, we believe that when the Messiah comes, we will understand everything. Jews became even stronger in their belief in their religion in the time of the Holocaust. But Jews, as they walked into the gas chambers, they died with the words Shema Yisrael on their lips. The fundamentalist attitude is that the Holocaust is an awesome punishment, awesome retribution by God for an awesome sin. With the beginning of the emancipation in Europe in the 19th centuries, Jews in uh, large numbers left the good old religion, copied the ways of the other nations, and then to compound this all came Zionism, a secular Jewish movement, which claimed Jews should return to their own land even before the Messiah had come, which is the traditional Jewish viewpoint that Messiah must, must launch the return to their land. Hence God felt it necessary to step in and show uh, his people, the Jewish people, how far they had transgressed emancipation, but the assimilation which came with emancipation and Zionism. And this is the punishment, as harsh as it is and as difficult 
And as painful, this is the way God operates in this world. This is a fundamentalist approach, which is rejected by Orthodox Jewish thinkers, uh, who are at a loss then to explain what persons could have done to merit such a punishment. If God indeed is a just God, if God foresees everything as Judaism and Christianity uh, profess, then the Holocaust is a stumbling block. And I'm afraid it will remain so forever, for generations to come. There is a point where theology stops, and I think the Holocaust is one of these points. I'm afraid. <laughs> Oh, my God.